This story is about, um, takes place 500 years ago, up on the I Arctic ice pack, and it's about Eskimos, uh, which we call, in terms of peoples, the Inuit peoples. Now, the Inuit peoples lived in the summer at the edge of the Arctic Ocean, and they lived in sort of little huts made out of skins and stuff like that. And they, they really didn't grow a whole lot, but they hunted reindeer and stuff during the summer. But in the winter, the Arctic Ocean freezes, and they would move out on the ice pack to um, hunt seals. And that's how the bands of Inuits, and they, there weren't very many people in a band, but that's how they lived, summer to winter. And this story takes place about 500 years ago, and there's a small band of Inuits out on the ice pack in December, more or less December, um, and they're starving to death. The hunters had been out and hunting for seals, and they hadn't had any luck getting seals. And the village wasn't very big. The village was uh, perhaps 40 to 45 people, men, women, and children. And so a decision was made um, to give their best hunter, the strongest and youngest hunter, all the provisions for himself and the dogs that he would need for his dog sled to go out. And the idea was that he would go out and out on the ice pack as far and as long as it took to find some seals and bring them back to the village. And if he didn't find any, he would die in the effort and the village would die. That was a decision. And that decision was made in, uh, <clears throat> in a, a meeting of the, the leaders in an, in an igloo. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about how those people live, but in an igloo, in a regular igloo, people wore very, very little clothes because the igloos were made in such a way that um, they were quite warm. They could be heated inside by a, um, a, a bowl, a small stone bowl of oil in which was a wick, like a candle wick, that would be lighted, and that would heat an igloo. Now, does anybody, if you're talking about 40 or 50 below temperatures uh, on the Arctic ice pack, does anybody know how an igloo is built so it could be warm on the inside? Yep. Like a dome? It is built like a dome. And do you know what it's built out of? Ice? Blocks of ice, correct, cut out of the cut out of the ice pack. That's correct. Does anybody know why it is warm on the inside? Because it's packed? No. Okay. An igloo has an entrance tunnel to it. And the entrance tunnel to an igloo is always built on a slant downward. Does anybody know why that would be? So the cold air can't get in? And why won't the cold air get in? Because heat rises. Right. Cold air settles and warm air rises. So if your entrance is below the living area of the igloo, cold air will settle to the entrance and warm air will stay in the igloo. The other thing is that the warmth of people's bodies and, and an oil lamp like that puts a, a um, it's quite cold obviously on the outside, puts a, a little bit of a glaze of, of uh, water, of melt on the inside of the ice blocks and that freezes. So you have a very nifty um, compartment in there and people really, I mean the truth of the matter is that the Inuits wore little or no clothes and they would have skins and stuff on the floor, but they wore very, very little clothes in the inside of an igloo. So very, very cool. And we just think, how could people live in that kind of a climate? Well, that's the way they lived. And their clothing, of course, was 
design for the climate as well, and we're going to talk about that. But that decision to send a hunter out was made in an igloo by the, by the leaders of the, of the band. And the hunter they chose was a 17-year-old boy named Inuk. And so um, over the next couple of days, he, they got together the, the six best dogs in the village to pull the dog sled. And they gave him all the supplies that they could spare. They didn't give him everything, but they gave him all the frozen fish for the dogs that they could, I mean, they really gave him enough for the dogs to go for, uh, you know, a week or 10 days. And they gave him enough food for himself. And the village was going to have to go, most of the dogs in the village would probably die because they gave the, the frozen fish, which were, were caught in the summer, they gave the frozen fish to Inuk to give his dogs enough energy to pull a dog sled because if he, if he found seals, they're going to have to pull the seals back, the dead seals back on the dog sled. So uh, about two days later, he set out. Now the temperature, you know, in that time of the year in the Arctic, there's, it's, it's really, it's, there's very little daylight, very short hours of daylight, mostly dark. Uh, nevertheless, um, he, would, he took with him for the daylight hours when the sun might be out, he took with him um, protection for his eyes. Now does anybody know because as you all know, you can get snow blind real quick with a bright sun on snow. Um, and so they didn't have dark glasses 500 years ago. So does anybody know what the eye protection was that the uh, Inuits or Eskimos would use? Huh. Yep. Spears? Nope. It was a block of wood that went across your eyes like glasses, and, and it was somewhat thick. And there was a slit cut through the wood. And so you looked out of a slit on either eye, and because it was thick, the slit, the, the wood itself caused a little shade in the slit so that there was no direct reflection into your eye. That's how they protected themselves from snow blindness. He also took, of course, um, boots, uh, long leggings, a parka um, with a hood, and mittens. Now, what people knew in the old days about keeping warm was you don't use gloves. Gloves we all use, but gloves are not a very efficient way to keep your hands warm. What keeps your hands warm is your fingers being together and you being able to put your thumbs into your, into your mittens if you need to. The thumbs would be the only thing that would be exposed. So they had, uh, he had heavy mittens and, and, and a parka and a hood. And um, they were made with seal skin with the, with the inside, the hairy part, in to the skin, okay? The inside of the skin of the seal to the outside of his body. So he had air particles trapped in the fur, okay, against his skin, understand? So what makes you stay warm is air, is air being heated and trapped. And the fur on the inside trapped the air heated by his body and they were very, very efficient. They were very efficient um, people on clothing for that kind of conditions. The other thing is his, um, the hood of his parka was, was surrounded with fur. Now at 20, 30, 40 below, when you're breathing, there's moisture that comes out of your nose and mouth. And um, there's one fur, one animal fur, that does not freeze in those kind of temperatures with moisture on it. Does anybody have a guess of what that might be? Polar bears? Good guess, no. Yep. Seals? Seal? No. Nope. It's, lo it's long fur. It's not, sh seal, seal skin is pretty short fur, but it's long fur. Yep. A snow tiger? Snow tiger? Yeah. Nope. Good, good guess. The, in the Arctic, uh, the snow leopards or snow tigers aren't so much in the Arctic. They're over in Asia, but that's a good, that's a good guess. Wolves? 
Nope. Like some type of buffalo? Be a caribou or something like that up there, a muskox. Good, good, uh, good guess, no. Well, I don't really know, but going with the name Arctic Fox. Close, but not, no. I'm not sure if this is exactly right, but a bison? Nope. Wolverine. Wolverine fur. Now, wolverines are a very cool animal. They are scared of nothing. They're about the size of a badger, a little bit bigger than a badger. I mean, but they are really, really fierce animals. They are scared of nothing. But they have a fur that doesn't freeze with moisture on it. So that you would try to wring the, the uh, hood of your parka with that fur so when you're breathing in and out in very cold temperatures, you, you don't, it doesn't freeze. Otherwise, it would freeze solid and, or freeze to you or stuff like that. So he, he was pretty well equipped. He took, um, he took a, uh, a harpoon, and I'll talk about that later, and he took a, um, a um, knife made out of bone with a bone blade. Um, and they made knives out of ivory, and they made knives out of bone, and they could sharpen though they they knew how to make those blades so that they were as sharp as a modern knife. So he set out. About the third day, he set out. Now, when we talk about set out with a dog sled and dogs, we're not talking about flat Arctic ice, OK? The Arctic isn't flat. There are plenty of places that are flat. But the ocean under the ice pack is moving. And so the ice is moving. And what you get is, what you get is pressure ridges. And pressure ridges are where the ice, where the ocean's moving, and the ice buckles up. And you might get a 10-foot high pressure ridge, and it's like a hill. And you've got to go over it, and it can be really steep, and it can have sort of little canyons in it or little rough places. Well, the dogs can pull to a degree, but the guy driving the dog sled has to push that sled up over, so it's very tiring to go up over pressure ridges and hills. Sometimes it's flat, that's cool. The dogs can pull, and he wouldn't generally have the dogs pull him. He would generally run behind the sled or walk behind the sled. He didn't, he wasn't in a, you know, like an Iditarod dog race. He wasn't in a sled dog race, so he wanted to conserve the energy of his dogs. So he wasn't moving, but they were moving steadily, but they weren't running all the time. But he'd have to fight the sled up over the ice ridges, pressure ridges, and down. So it was very, very tiring. So we went out the first day. And um, he, ha he was headed out. He wanted to head out towards open water in the ocean because the seals um, are under the ice pack. More of them are under the ice pack close to open water than they are way, way in, in inland because seals are air-breathing animals. They're mammals, right? They don't just perpetually. They've got to come up for air. So they moved out. He moved out. And the first day, he got as far as he could, and, and he has to stop. And he um, stakes the dogs out with a stake in the snow and a leather strap and all six dogs were staked apart from each other so they wouldn't fight over food. And he gave them each a frozen, a big frozen fish. And then he had to make himself a sh something for the night. And at building an igloo was way too problematic when you're out on a hunting trip and you're just moving night to night. So what he did was he cut blocks of ice and snow with his knife out and, and dug a trench with a wall. The, the blocks came out and made a wall. And he, he made the wall in the direction from which the wind was blowing. In this case, the wind was blowing um, to the north from the south. So he made the wall to, uh, uh, in the blocking the south wind. And then the trench from which the blocks had come out of is where he slept. And he got down in the trench, and he, and he had all the stuff on, and he got, had a big sealskin robe that he put over him and put his head under it and everything. And he slept there, and the wind, it's like the wind would hit that wall and go over the trench so he wasn't exposed to the wind. The wind, it would blow over the, over the wall and over his trench. 
And he, amazingly enough, he was quite comfortable. And when he woke up in the morning, although it was really what we would call morning, really dim light, when he woke up, about eight inches of snow had fallen. And so he got up and the dogs were gone. It was just snow everywhere. And so he stood up and he gave a whistle and six explosions of snow happened. The dogs were all asleep under the snow. And when he whistled, they all jumped up. And all six dogs exploded, had a snow explosion where they were. So he got his dogs hooked up to the sled, and he went on that day. Same thing that night. No sign. He wasn't getting close to the open water. No sign of seals. Now, what he was looking for was an area where the ice was really, really thin, really thin, thin enough that a seal could come up under it and break it with his nose. And through, throughout the ice pack, there are areas where the ice is thin. And what the seals would do would, would be to come up and break the ice to breathe. Okay? So that's what he's looking for. He didn't find any. Now, one of the other animals living out in the Arctic, of course, is the polar bear. Now, the polar bear is a pretty interesting bear in that the polar bear is the only uh, animal in North America and maybe very one of the very few animals in the world that will hunt men, will hunt humans for food. Polar bears are scared of nothing. They like that the wolverines are scared of nothing, and they will hunt humans for food. Polar bear, um, a big polar bear will weigh 1,200 pounds. If they stand up on their back legs, polar bear can be nine feet tall. Nine feet tall, well, I'm about six feet, so that's three feet taller than I am, and they're massive. And so uh, polar bears also eat seals. Seals are one of their primary foods. Seals and sea lions are one of their primary food in the winter. And they live up in that area, in that uh, in the Arctic ice pack, and you know they can swim. They're great swimmers. They can go into that water and swim long distances. And of course, they're perfectly suited to the uh, to the Arctic. They are enormously strong, enormously strong. Um, so. Enoch was looking for blowholes for the seals, uh, uh, thin ice where the seals come up and, and breathe. Polar bears would be looking for the same thing. So the third day, at the end of the third day, he, uh, right at the end of the day, he, see, he comes on and he's, he's really close to the edge of the open ocean now. I mean, it's not far. And he comes on a very thin, a thin piece of ice, very, very thin. And so he immediately, um, there's a pressure ridge off to the side to his left. He takes the dogs and the sled and stakes the dog and the sled out behind the pressure ridge. Okay, And then he comes back and he sits by the, with the blowhole or the, 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 the thin ice blowhole, potential blowhole, out in front of him and he sits cross-legged. Sets himself cross-legged. And at his side is a harpoon. Now the harpoon is not dissimilar from a whaling harpoon. It's a shaft of wood, and in the end of the shaft is, a, is an ivory point, a very, very sharp ivory point detachable that comes out of the shaft. And it's a point that is like, um, it's like that. So it has a very, very sharp point there, but it has a, an edge coming out <clears throat> like a half an arrowhead. And the reason for that is that it won't pull out. If you stab it in, it'll lock in the flesh of the seal and won't pull out. Attached to the end of the, of the ivory harpoon head is a, is a, a leather rawhide uh, woven um, braided rope, and that's coiled behind him here. And the harpoon 
itself is here by his hand. And he sits there like this, and he sits down, and he doesn't move. And he watches the ice right in front of him. And it's real thin. <clears throat> and an hour goes by, and he hasn't moved. And it's about 35 degrees below zero. And he hasn't moved. Another hour goes by, and he sits. Another hour goes by. Now, I ask you to think about sitting in a cross-legged position for 15 minutes without moving, much less three hours. Four hours, another hour goes by, four hours. And here's the deal. When it's a life or death deal, you do whatever you have to do, right? We don't have to, we're not in life or death situations sitting cross-legged like that for four hours. We're, we're not in life. He was in a life and death situation, and when you're in that situation, you do what you have to do. So he sat there, and at the end of about four hours, the only thing that moved was his eyes, and he's looking, and at the end of about four hours, a shadow passes under the ice. The ice is thin enough that he can see a shadow pass under it, and he doesn't move. And then the shadow comes back this way. And then there's, the shadow disappears and then comes back and there's a whack on the ice and it breaks and just the teeniest tip of a nose pokes up. But the ice is broken and a little opening appears in this ice. And he sits there. The shadow goes back another time. And then the seal sticks his head up through the ice to take a breath. And in that moment, after four hours of sitting in that temperature without moving, <clears throat> his hand moved faster than you could imagine anyone could move. He picked up the harpoon with his right hand and rammed it into the neck of the seal as hard as he could, right into the neck of the seal, deep into the neck of the seal. It happened so fast you wouldn't have believed he could have moved that fast. We absolutely couldn't have moved that fast. We'd have been frozen sitting there. I mean, we'd have been, you know. And it ran, and the seal went down, immediately dove, and the, the, the rope, the braided rope starts going out, right? And he grabs it in his, in his two mittens, Okay, and he lets it go and lets it go and lets it go, and then it's, he starts squeezing on the rope, slowing, slowing the seal, slowing. And finally the seal slows and then, then stops, and then the seal starts trying to pull away, and he won't let it pull away. And basically, the combination of the, of the harpoon in the seal's neck and no air from not being able to come up, the seal is dead, dies. And after about 20 minutes, <clears throat> he pulls the seal up, and the harpoon head is, long, is firmly in it, and he pulls it out on the ice and drags it away from the blowhole and cuts it open with his knife, instantly cuts it open and cuts out the liver and takes a huge big bite and eats about half the liver of the seal right on the spot. Now that sounds really gross, but think about it. Liver is very, very nutritious. Liver, the liver of an, any animal is very nutritious. The other thing is, it's hot. You think, ah, raw food, raw liver, yeah! It's hot. 35 below zero, it's hot. They were used to eating, they ate blubber. They ate, their diet was primarily blubber because, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So they were used to eating raw stuff, and raw meant nothing to them. Hot was really great, you know? It really tasted good. And he had been, you know, near starvation, so he ate, and the liver's pretty big, he ate half of it right on the spot. Dragged the seal away from the dogs behind the pressure ridge and went back and sat down. 
re reset his harpoon and sat there. Two hours later, another seal came by and he got a second seal and hauled it up. And now he's had enough for the moment. So he, he drags the seals over to the, over to the sled and puts them on the sled. And he, they've obviously there's blood all over the snow, but he puts them up on the sled and tries to, to get as much blood out of them before he put them on the sled. He hooks up the dogs to the sled and they, they go away. And he tries to leave no trail of blood from the sled as he goes away. And he went about a mile away and figured he'd spend the night and then he'd come back and try for another seal in the morning. So he um, <clears throat> makes his, his uh, a, a snow wall and a snow trench, stakes the dogs out and goes to sleep. And when he wakes up the next morning, He's on an island. And what had happened was, in the night, the ocean moved and the ice pack separated. And, and part of the ice pack where he was sleeping separated from the main ice pack and went out in the open ocean. And he was on an island about 300 yards long, about three football fields long, and about a, a little over a football field wide. And the dogs are there, they're, on, they're floating. And they're about 400 yards across open water from the main ice pack. Well, when he nook, woke up and saw what had happened, he wasn't particularly concerned because he knew that sooner or later the wind would blow him back into the ice pack. He'd be all right, everything would be fine. So he wasn't particularly concerned, but here's what concerned him when he stood up. Back on the ice pack was a polar bear, a huge polar bear. And the polar bear was standing at the edge of the ice pack looking out at his island. And it was swinging its head back and forth like this and smelling. And somehow what had happened was the polar bear had come on the blowhole smelled the blood and somehow had tracked them through the night. Fortunately, the, their ice pack had shifted and had broken off so the polar bear hadn't come on them during the middle of the night. And so Inuk's watching. <clears throat> he's looking at the polar bear and he's watching and the polar bear's, it's an enormous polar bear and his head's moving like this. And all of a sudden, the polar bear jumps in the water and starts to swim for the island. So he knows what he, what he needs to do, and he immediately takes the two seals off the sled and leaves them. He, get, he hooks the dogs up to the sled. He leaves, he leaves the sled and the seals. He doesn't hook the dogs up. He takes the dogs with him, and he goes to the far end of the island. And at the far end of the island is a four-foot pressure ridge, just a four-foot ridge of, of, of um, snow and ice that goes up and down. And then there's about, about as far as um, from that door to that wall to the open water. In other words, the pressure ridge is there, the open water is there. So what he does is he gets his three dogs and himself right about here with their backs to the water but facing the pressure ridge about four feet high. And he stakes three dogs out on his left and he stakes three dogs out on his right and he puts his harpoon here and all he has is his knife. It's a pretty wicked knife. It's a, it's a bone ivory knife. It's pretty wicked. But, and so then he goes back over to the pressure ridge and looks up over the top of it down the other end of the island. And he watches the polar bear swim all the way across the water and climb onto the island. And the polar bear goes to the seals and sniffs around the seals 
but doesn't do anything. The polar bear looks up, shakes his head, and starts coming up the island. And so Inuk watches him until he gets pretty close, and then he backs off and takes his position facing the pressure ridge with the dogs and waits. And the first thing he sees is this huge head of the polar bear appear up over the pressure ridge, looking at him. And the bear watches him, and the bear then climbs the pressure ridge down onto his side of the pressure ridge and stands up. And it's at least 10 feet tall. It's a 1,200 pound massive polar bear. And this polar bear is moving his head, and this low growling starts. And the polar, and he, the polar bear stands up, and then he drops down onto all fours and starts coming towards him. And at that point, Enoch takes his knife and he cuts the ties on the three dogs on his right. And the dogs immediately <laughs> charge for the polar bear. And they circle the polar bear. They don't get too close and they circle him. And there you're barking and, and the polar bear stops and is kind of watching the dogs. The dogs are running around and one dog gets too close. Your eye couldn't even see it. The polar bear hooked the dog and hooked him and disemboweled him. All his entrails came out. And he hooked him and threw him like that, through the air, up over the pressure ridge behind him. And when that happened, the other two dogs wanted no part of the polar bear. And they took off over the pressure ridge. That was the end of them. So the polar bear turns around and faces Enoch and starts coming. And he cuts the three dogs on the, on the left. They wanted no part of the polar bear at all. They wanted nothing to do with the polar bear. They just took off over the pressure ridge down to the other end of the island. So the polar bear now is about, oh, maybe uh, probably about 20 feet from Enoch. And Enoch backs up. If he goes into the water, he's dead in a minute, right? The water is so cold, the water is so cold up in the Arctic that he's, he's dead. So there ain't no choice of going into the water. He's dead, okay? There's not much choice of defeating the polar bear because he's got his harpoon and his knife, but I mean, it's a massive animal. And the polar bear stands up again. 10 feet tall. You're looking up at him like that. And he starts to drop down. And he nooks looking at the polar bear. And all of a sudden, the air in between them gets real shimmery. You know when you look down a highway on a summer day and you can see the heat waves coming off? Yeah. What that's shimmery like that. The air gets real shimmery between him and the polar bear. And the polar bear stands back up and goes woof and backs up on top of the pressure ridge. And Enoch stands there, and the polar bear stands there. And then the polar bear starts moving his head like this and comes back down and starts advancing. And he gets about 20 feet away. And all of a sudden, the air gets shimmery again. And it, it's very peculiar. And he looks looking, and the air's shimmery, and he's looking. And the polar bear goes, woof, and turns around, climbs up on the pressure ridge, trots down the other side of the pressure ridge, down to the other end of the island, pays no attention to the dead seals, no attention to the dogs, which scatter and come back up to Anook's end of the island, jumps in the water, and swims back to the main ice pack. Climbs up 400 yards later and disappears. That night, the wind blew Anook's island back into the ice pack. 
He went back to the blowhole. He was able to get another seal that day. And then he headed for home. And he got to the village literally at the last minute. He, got, he saved the village, but they were, they were, you know, kids were 24 hours from starting to die when he got there. And he saved the village. The three seals were enough, and then he went back and he saved the village. And he became a great hunter for that band of Inuits throughout his life. And he was, he was uh, a legend in that village. And every December, more or less about the middle, uh, middle end of December, what we'd call the middle or end of December, all the people in the village would get together in at one igloo and ask Enoch to tell the story over and over about what had happened. And this is what he would, would say. The air got all shimmery between me and the polar bear. And the polar bear gave a wolf and backed up. And then he came at me again. And the air got all shimmery again. And as I was looking, I was trying to see what was going on. I could barely, barely see by squinting my eyes. I saw a dog sled between me and the polar bear. And there were caribou. And there was an Eskimo. There was an Inuit on the dog sled. But his seal skins were red. And on the top of his head, his seal skin hat was red. And there was a white ball on the top of his hat. And that is the end of the story. That's interesting. Oh. <laughs>